Welcome back everyone and today we're going to be turning this 52 foot poly tunnel into a 52 foot no dig poly tunnel. Welcome back everyone and thank you for tuning in again. Dan from Freedom Forest here and today as you can see I'm in our tunnel number two affectionately called T2 and if you've watched any of our previous videos you will know that uh, these frames were here on this piece of land but it was completely covered in willow trees between the gaps and inside was just dense thick bramble bindweed bracken you name it it's had it all uh, so over the winter time we got uh, this tunnel recovered and unfortunately not long enough this plastic black membrane has been down, you can probably see behind me, only for about four weeks, which has been enough to uh, start to brown off and begin the process of killing some of these fog-like weeds, but um, it's not gonna have been long enough to kill them fully, unfortunately. But it is now mid-May, so we really have to get this thing ready this weekend, ready for planting. Uh, we've got a whole greenhouse full of melons, cucumbers, tomatoes, and all other goodness to plant up in here. So you can probably see beside me here, this tiller or cultivator, and it probably seems very hypocritical after talking about how we're no dig for me to crack this out first thing. I'm gonna be just doing a one-time run over in here because the ground where we've had the cover on for several months now and there's been no watering in here has gone quite dry and it's very bumpy in places. We've had a few rabbits manage to get in and dig around. And I just wanted to uh, distinguish the difference between using these as a one-off in an initial bed preparation um, as opposed to using it annually or regularly. So this is just gonna be a one-off use um, just to kind of break the surface up very slightly, only going down about an inch or two, so I can rake it flat uh, before applying our lovely compost mulch and wood chips, and then we'll never use this again. Um, and that is very different to kind of using this at the beginning of the season, and then maybe hoeing around your plants uh, several times while they're establishing the weeds around them, and then using this again each year, which is continually breaking up that soil web of uh, organisms down there, all the worm tunnels, um, all the mycorrhizal fungi as well. Uh, so no, they have their place sometimes, but definitely won't be making a regular use of this. I've just found a little friend living underneath the black membrane. And everyone has been saying to me that I should get some traps and kill these, but I think they're so adorable. Let me just see if I can show you them. little mousy here and just because we are human and we can dominate pretty much every environment and they may interfere with some of our crops particular animals but their home is in the countryside and I don't think it's right to just exterminate them all just because they're a slight pain to us we have even had one uh, eat through the plastic on one of our tunnels to make a little tunnel through and our net house but Still, they're still our friends, and this is their home as well before we were here, so they're welcome to stay. Oh! <laughs> he just bit me. <laughs> still my friend though. So before I start, I probably should mention, as we're indoors, I'm going to be wearing this gas mask respirator. And it's not just like a dust one, it is actually for gases as well. Very important.
joking. I knew you couldn't hear me really. So guys, I have now finished the tillim. It's a couple of hours later and the soil now is much more level and fine and at least I know the first two to three inches are soft for our roots so they're not going straight down into compacted like concrete soil. So now the final job for me tonight before I go is to dig around the edges here and get out any remaining weeds that are still there before we start the next process. So I've just picked up this piece of soil because it's all right me going on about how tilling and digging over your soil or beds is detrimental when plants still seem to grow okay. But take a look here at the vast array of different animal tunnels and it's not just worms that live in the soil as well. You also get amphipods, which are things like millipedes, centipedes and grubs. And it's often said that a handful of soil has more living organisms than people on the planet, which is pretty amazing. And that's before you even mentioned fungi that form vast networks like mycorrhizal fungi you might have heard of, which help plants absorb more water and nutrients, increase drought resistance, and they can also reduce infection by diseases as well. And they can also provide nitrogen to your plants. It can sometimes be seen in really healthy soil looking like um, white roots or threads, uh, a bit like this one. But best of all, you can even see how nature aerates the soil naturally with how this plant root is using this old wormhole or tunnel left by a previous plant root. You're pretty much just taking a sledgehammer to your soil's health and immune system when you dig your beds over. Hello guys. Well, it's now the next day and I've finished doing the weeding all around the outsides, which took a bit of time actually, because there was loads of creeping buttercup and some other bits in there. And had to be very careful not to go through the plastic as well, which is very delicate. Um, also, in the meantime, I've been over the area and raked it all as level as I can now. And that's something that's quite important because when we're gonna be putting our compost on, in the next stages, if we have very undulating ground, once we rake that over flat, we may end up with some areas with only an inch or so of compost, others might have four or five inches. And this was very up and down, um, as I mentioned, because of rabbits and other uh, activity that had been going on in here since it was last used. Now, something that is actually really important that I wanted to mention before progressing is that a far more efficient way of doing this and time-saving way would be to use cardboard uh, if you have flat ground already. Um, put cardboard down, you can do that directly on top of the weeds, it doesn't matter if they're perennial. You don't even have to cut them first, so you could do this literally on top of an existing lawn or whatever you've got there. So you want to get cardboard uh, that has as little print on as possible so you're not getting those inks going into the ground. And you want to remove all of the uh, tape and parcel tape on them as well. And have them overlapping, um, undone and overlapping by about four or five inches each. What we've used um, on our outdoor beds, uh, which is quite a large area, is the parcel tape. Well, not, not parcel tape, but it's, it comes in a big roll and it's basically like a cardboard wrapping paper. You often get it wrapped around boxes and parcels and that comes in big long lengths. You can buy like, I can't remember how many meters in a row. I think we've had like at least a hundred meters before. And it's not as thick as cardboard, but if you double it up, it still does a good job. And that just initially just holds the weeds down, pins them down against the floor with the weight of the compost on top. Um, and it just for the initial few weeks before it breaks down, which it does over time, it just stops the new growth emerging through. And I've also found in the past that you might think, oh, I'll just 
run the lawnmower over this first, so it's very low down. But um, when the weeds are still left intact and just folded over and held down, that seems to be a bit more effective as well, in my experience, than cutting the lawn or whatever weeds you've got there, because then where the new growth is coming, it's trying to go directly up through the cardboard. Um, so it's got more chance over you know a month or so period of making its way through. And probably the next most important thing after that is just the depth of the material you're putting on. So as you'll see in the next process, um, we're gonna be putting at least five inches of compost down. And on top of that, we're gonna be putting several inches of wood chips as well. But before we move on to that, I've had to think about the layout I'd like to do in here. And as you can see to the sides and above me, we have the benefit of having these bars running along. And there is a couple of inches gap between those and the plastic, which means we can actually utilize those by tying on strings, um, which we can use for climbing plants like our tomatoes, cucumbers, melons, that kind of thing. So what I'm actually going to do in utilizing those is to have three beds, one along the center and one along either side with two paths in the middle. And these tunnels are roughly four meters wide. So I'm thinking a meter either side on the two uh, left and right beds and a meter in the middle, which would leave half a meter for each of our footpaths either side. So I'm gonna mark that out now with some bamboo and some string and we'll see how it looks. Okay, so I'm just gonna do a quick test measure between these two poles just to make sure I'm right in remembering the width of it. Okay, yeah, so it's 4.2 meters between those two. So I'm just gonna actually lay out a few rocks and see what looks good really. Yeah, so what I think I'm gonna go for is We've got 4.2 meters, so I think I'm going to go 1.1 meter from both edges. And then that gives us a meter in the middle and then two half meter footpaths either side, which is just enough room to get a wheelbarrow down. I don't want to take up too much room with the paths because, you know, they're just paths. It's only every now and again I'm going to have to get a wheelbarrow in here anyway. So, yeah, I think we'll go for that. 1.1 metres for our outside bed. Half a metre for one pathway. One metre for our middle bed. Half a metre for our second pathway. And 1.1 metres again on the outside. All right, that's our first bed marked out. Now I'm gonna do just one at a time to save cutting the string into loads of different pieces. The fun part now is start wheelbarrowing the compost in. I've got a wheelbarrow all down quite a long way from the car park through quite a boggy, muddy track at the moment. So I'm gonna to have to lay down some wood chips here, I think first before we can even begin. And here is some of our compost. This is a couple of van loads and I reckon we're probably gonna need two more van loads to do the whole thing in there. Okay, so I'm going to work my way along here now, aiming for a minimum of about four inches as we go and work my way along to the end. Yeah. 
something to bear in mind as well is that compost does initially, I wouldn't say compact, but if you just give it a little walk on, it will compact a little bit. Um, and that's not making compaction like you'd get in your soil, but it just takes some of the air out. So, you know, you're not gonna end up with only an inch or so by the end of it. Okay guys, so we now have our three beds um, covered with our compost, nice and thick. And what I'm going to be doing now before moving on to anything else is I have a couple of sacks of uh, potash or ash from the fire, uh, which is gonna be quite high in mineral content and act as a natural fertilizer, basically. You may have heard of uh, the term slash and burn, which is often used in the tropics where large areas or small areas um, of forest or vegetation are cleared, left to dry on the floor, and then that area burnt. And then the yields are very good for a couple of years afterwards, um, but only a couple of years because the fire actually kills most of the um, life and microorganisms in the actual soil itself. But the good, uh, growth and uh, yields come from the mineral content from all of the ash that's left on the floor. So we're going to be uh, using some of um, that beautiful ash power um, as a fertiliser. So I'm going to spread that out now. All right, guys, so next step is our pathways and you can probably see either side of me I've just been and got some wood chips and I just wanted to describe the difference between uh, different materials you can get which might commonly be called wood chips. Um, the main thing being wood bark which is commonly sold um, at hardware stores and places like that you only get the bark of usually pine or conifer type trees and that is very different to uh, the product that we use, which is actually wood chips, which are the uh, basically the waste products from tree surgeons. And they contain not only the uh, carbon or the wood uh, of the actual stems and brushwood itself, but also the leaves, um, or it could be pine needles in uh, the example of pine trees. So I'll just show you a quick example of what I mean here. So hopefully you can see that. And the big difference is with this and tree bark is that, as you can see, there's a multiple multitude of different sizes here from small to large. And this importantly also includes all of the leaves as well. Um, and why that is significant is that leaves will contain a um, high amount of nitrogen whereas just the kind of wood chippy bits in there um, are predominantly carbon. So if you are gonna be using this just for your pathways, you could get away with just using the bark, but this is a far better product because as this rots down over time, uh, your plant roots are gonna be going into the pathways as well, and they're gonna be getting a good overall feed as well as your wood chips are breaking down. So if you're looking to achieve a kind of standard no-dig bed made popular by Charles Dowding, for example, where he uses the compost as the final layer, um, then yeah, you can use either, I guess, on your paths. But if you're going the extra mile like we're going to and um, using your wood chips on top of the beds as well, then I would definitely recommend you try to source some wood chips 
because then you're getting a overall feed as well as this rots down. And not only that, it's quite economical uh, to get hold of as well because it's normally a waste product from tree surgeons or tree services. Um, they often, in fact, most of the time, especially in this area, have to actually pay to get rid of this after doing a job. So there's two ways of normally sourcing it. One, you could, if you've got somewhere where they can pull up in their van and tip it out, have it delivered um, directly to your place if you give them a call, if you've got the correct access, and they'll probably charge you something for it. The downside to that is they're gonna be green and fresh, and really you want these at least a season old. So you can see the stuff that we're putting down here is all the green has kind of gone from it now um, and it's no longer producing heat like a compost pile would. Uh, so it's quite inert in that sense. And then the problem with using it very fresh and green uh, could be also if you're using more conifer or pine, um, you could get potentially a few issues with um, acidity uh, because they are on the pH scale would tend to be more acidic but as they do break down that acidity does pretty much disappear uh, contrary to a lot of belief. Uh, we've been making beds here often a foot thick on top of our compost in other places uh, with predominantly pine or conifer and I've done a pH test into that wood chip material which is rotted down almost to what I would describe as wood chip compost now, which is amazing. Um, and the pH is pretty much neutral. So don't panic too much about what you're getting. It has to be hardwood or whatever, because um, there doesn't seem to be any problems with high levels of uh, acidity in the soil as it breaks down. Um, so yeah, make sure it's uh, breaking down if you can, um, if you've got time to let it sit first. But how we actually get ours is uh, by going to the local green waste site where the wood, sorry, the tree surgeons actually take it to. And uh, it's still very cheap to buy it there uh, in bulk. We just go in with our bags and fill them up. And that way they've already had it sitting for a year. So it's ready to go straight away. And likewise with the compost when I was laying that, I'll give these a good walk over as well to compact them down as we go to make sure they're not going to sink too much in the next coming few weeks. All right, well, hopefully you agree. Things are starting to look pretty good in here. Compost down, wood chip paths done. Now, this is where you could just leave it and finish as this if you were doing a standard traditional no dig bed. But we're gonna go one stage further and make these back to Eden beds. And if you're not sure what back to Eden is, there's a really good documentary on YouTube for free with the name Back to Eden. And it is a must watch because it had a big influence on us and taught us many fundamental lessons of working with nature instead of against it. So, I'll leave that for you to check out. But in the meantime, the simplified version of what we're doing here is effectively gonna be putting down wood chips on top of the beds as well. And you might think, oh no, it looks so beautiful, don't ruin it. Um, but there's two main reasons we're gonna be doing that. One of those is that me and Laurie are both, uh, we both work as professional contract gardeners, so we, can't be here enough as we'd like to, to give it full attention every day, and watering every day. So what the additional wood chips on top is gonna to do for us is not only dramatically reduce any weeds that should happen to uh, pop up if there's anything left in this compost. Um, and on top of that, it's also gonna dramatically reduce the amount of watering we need to do because wood chips literally hold water and retain it like a sponge and then release it again um, as the plants need it, it's available to them. So that's I guess two benefits but there is an additional major one. Um, you probably can't see because I've just been out having my lunch but before I left I was soaking wet with sweat 
and I don't normally sweat much, but it must be at least 30 degrees in here. It feels like when you go on holiday somewhere tropical and get off the plane. So one of the things that um, increases the temperature inside here is having the black surfaces like the top of this compost. Um, if you go in one of the other tunnels uh, that don't have the black compost down at the moment, it's much noticeably cooler. So putting that down on top also should help with the lighter surface of the wood chips to um, reduce the temperature slightly as well in the peak season. So one thing that's very important when you're doing this, um, when you're using wood chips in this way, is that you never actually want to be digging them in. Um, that may go without saying, the fact we're calling this no dig, um, but you don't want to be digging these into your soil. Uh, there's reasons for that, and uh, we will do perhaps a sit down video sometime fairly soon in the future where we go through some of the issues around uh, doing that and uh, what outcomes that can be caused by doing it. Um, but we're effectively just using this as a surface mulch for the purposes of so, uh, moisture retention and the other benefits I've mentioned. And when it comes to planting, as I say, we won't be digging in, we'll just simply pull this back. If we've got a plant that's already a plug plant or in a pot, pop it in and then pull the wood chips back round. And if we're sowing direct, we can pull a trench out like this to expose our compost, sow into it, put another bit of compost into the, uh, the trench we've made with our finger. It's as simple as that. So it stays on top. And I'm not gonna go crazy deep with this because we've already got quite a nice surface layer of organic matter on top of our topsoil now that should be suppressing those weeds, any seeds that's still gonna be in that soil down there. And I'm just gonna make this so it's slightly raised from our pathways, just so I can actually see where the beds are for the time being. And it's not to say in the future we don't have these just purely as compost like they are at the moment. Uh, we can always rake it off, but for now, this is what suits our requirements. So that's what we're gonna do. And I wouldn't be tempted in all honesty to try and mark the beds with uh, say stones or rocks down the outside or something because that's quite a nice place for slugs and snails to hide out, including wooden edges especially. So in this case, I really am only going about an inch of depth with the wood chips and that's just enough to take that punishing kind of direct sun on a hot summer's day, take the pressure off the surface of our, our compost or soil um, in terms of the drying effect the sun has. So the wood, the carbon in this really takes the pound in and the moisture can stay underneath for us. One of the really beautiful benefits, yet again another benefit, there are just so many of doing this, is that we really are inoculating our exhausted topsoil that you saw in the beginning that was all dry and dusty and pretty much no organic matter in there. It's now inoculated of all of the tens of thousands and millions of microorganisms from the compost that's been decomposing for the last season um, and all of the fungi that's going to be naturally present in these wood chips as they've brought down as well all which are vitally important to have good soil health okay guys it's getting hotter and hotter so before you see me turn to a sweaty mess i think we'll leave it here for today you can see what i'm going to do i've just got to cover these last two beds of wood chips and if you might be a bit skeptical as to, is this gonna work? It seems a lot of input to put in um, for what may become a sea of weeds in a couple of weeks time. I'd like to invite you, because as they say, the proof is in the pudding, to subscribe to our channel uh, by pressing the subscribe button below the video and the little notification bell next to it. It doesn't cost anything, but what that will do is notify you when we put on a new video. And when you log on to YouTube, the chances are one of our videos might be on the home screen. 
and it might save you some time watching dancing cats or people falling off bicycles and things like that. So until next time, my friends, peace and plants. <laughs>